Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the Shadow Tech Goddess Part 3, Chapter 3, The Tempest Vindal. Mm. In our last chapter, Paymaster Stenstrom and Lady Gwendolyn's solitude on the long-lost world of Ing was rudely interrupted by the arrival of the George Parr. They immediately sent down a crew in suborbitals, which are, or rip cars, which are just like little small ships, and they assembled a some sort of device, and then a giant mile-high hologram of Professor Hannah Ben Sherlamp punched its way into the sky, welcoming those coming to Ing with the clear intention of proving that she's the one who discovered Ing's location. When it becomes generally known that Ing has been rediscovered and the League sends a, a ship, an armada, to explore the world, which they undoubtedly will, what will be waiting for them but a huge hologram of Hannah Ben Sherlamp. Pretty convincing proof. And then they get a message from their good friend, the Lacerta, who's just aching to kill the both of them in an epic battle where no one's going to interfere and she's just thrilled and she can't wait. The George Parr locates their campfire where they were sheltering for the evening, blows it to smithereens. Lady Gwendolyn was like, I wonder why, why would fleet crew open up on, a, on other fleet personnel? They shouldn't, that should be against their oh they it is their duty with order to do so to mutiny but they did not we'll find out why in this reading i think if i'm remembering correctly and they continue to make their way towards this monstrous uh, monolith in the distance and we'll learn more about that as we go along in a very sad note after the lacerda was done threatening and bragging they throw out a the dead body of morgan jetterix let it hit the ground hoping that if he is there he'll come and try to pick it up and then they can zero him and blow him to smithereens but he was faded into the shadows evading their sensors and there was poor morgan dead and he grieved for her he loved morgan just in a very different way than he loved or he loves lady gwendolyn but still his grief was profound and he stayed with her for a while and then he made her a, a grave and hopes that when the fleet does come they will exhume morgan and, and return her to her home in the hala lands of cana so that's where we left off let's proceed immediately and see what horrible things happen in this chapter Part 3, Chapter 3, The Tempest Vindal. When he returned to the tree, Gwen already had a small smoldering fire going inside the tree stump. She had created a number of relief holes for venting the smoke with her fedula, but the air inside the stump was still heavy and hard to breathe. She coughed under her breath and stayed low. We have to be careful, Belle. Even with the diminished sensing capacity, the George Parr and Sherlamp's bloody hologram can detect minute variations in heat, smell our smoke if we let the fire burn too hot, and hear our conversations if we talk too loud. Her throat was ragged from the smoke. She hacked and shut her mouth. She entered his mind. I suggest we forget our mouths for the time being and keep to the covert realms of our mental connection. Fair enough. He filleted the fish and put them over the fire. His mind parted as Gwen settled in. Her throat hurt from the smoke. Her ankle hurt in the damp morning air. And she had an odd, slow burn deep within her, like a bundle of ache stretching out, filling every part of her and hurting just enough to be noticeable and annoying. I've started my monthly cycle, Belle. It's going to get worse and worse for a week or so. I've never disabled my womb. We don't do that in Xenon. Tara was always a little bundle of bad energy when she was on her cycle. That reminds me. Tara, are you out there? He thought over the Tregador. Tara! No reply. Odd, she should be responding right away, unless she was asleep or in the shower or didn't have it on her wrist. He was certain the Seeker was safe. 
the Lacerta would have mentioned something should they have further damaged her. Still, the silence was worrisome. He'd try her again later. Soon the fish was ready and Gwen eagerly pulled the pieces off the fire, transferring them from hand to hand as they were hot. Oh, this is good, she thought, savoring the hot fish. I've always been a dainty eater, but it seems since we've been here I've thought about nothing other than my stomach. I wish we had some seasoning. A little salt and pepper would do well. Some lemons, too. I'll keep an eye out for such things, if they're available. I'm sure we'll find something out here we can use to add flavor to our dinner, as it looks like we might be out here for at least a few months. I estimate we'll be here at least four months, given the possible disabled state of the Seeker, the informing of the fleet, the call-out and the assembling of an armada, and the return trip at speed. The sailing speed of the vessel sent for our rescue is also a concern, and that is assuming we can stay low of the George Parr. I'm thinking we shouldn't delay. We find this shrine, we get at the anatometer and turn the knob, then we're done with it. As for this situation here, we'll just find some nice quiet part of the world where the George Parr and Sherlamp's hologram can't find us to hole up in until the fleet arrives. Then grabbed another piece off the coals. I think our best bet is to go underground. I'm certain there's underground habitations left by our ancestors we can repatriate. All we need to do is find and make use of them. She swallowed a bite of fish. The thing they threw out last night. What was it? He darkened and didn't answer. Gwen nudged further into his thoughts. She was devastated for a moment as images of Morgan's broken body in her grave of stones filtered into her mind. I, I never meant for that to happen. I thought she was safely off the George Parr. I did too, but apparently not, and it cost Morgan her life. It might sound odd given our often contentious working relationship, but I considered her a friend and I admired her skills. Of course, I didn't approve of some of her vices, and I most certainly never intended to go to bed with her. But she was a good hospitaler and a fine lady. I know you liked her, Bill, and I'm sorry. He nodded. They finished their meal and crept out. The giant tree stump they'd sheltered in was the largest feature of a narrow wetland that went on for about a mile until the ground dried. Beyond the landscape fell away in a large escarpment that dropped down into a tumbled valley that stretched off to the horizon. There, at the edge of the escarpment, they got their first really good look at the vast shape in the distance, the gigantic monolith. It was a spheroid, roughly egg-shaped, and apparently lying on its side. At some point in the past, it might have been standing upright, doubling its already staggering height. It was made of a brownish stone that was irregularly cut, like a relief atlas. It had a facial disc of some sort, though there were no discernible features. It also had a pair of great curved protrusions, like a set of rough-hewn horns that met over the top. One of the horns curved directly over the monolith, and the other was beneath it, mostly buried in the ground. To the east, about 50 miles away, Hannah Ben Sherlamp's hologram sat quietly at its holographic desk, busy doing nothing. Stenstrom got out his trusty mega-eye and looked the monolith over. Magnified, he could see layers of hanging clouds condensing around its girth, it was so huge that seeing it blown up through the lens of his mega-eye made it lose its identity as a shape and appear as nothing more than a continuation of the land tipped on its side. Gwendolyn settled into his mind and looked through the mega-eye with him. It's got to be at least 50 miles away still. More like a hundred. Look at it. Stenstrom noticed something tiny and slow-moving circling the heights of the monolith. It looked like a white gnat buzzing about and harassing the horned head of a water buffalo. 
The George Parr, there she is. Look at the contrails. They're just loitering around, casting their net, waiting to zero us. And recall, Duval is after the anatometer for his own purpose. Then we're moving out together. We'll use TK, stay low to the ground, and avoid bodies of water. Duval will focus his scanning beams there, expecting us to use them for cover. When we near, we'll have to suspend the TK and walk. The Lacerda will be able to detect us if we get too close. Gazing at the monolith in the distance with grim determination, Stenstrom stood and put his mega eye away. Gwen smiled and adjusted her fedula, locking it in place. She put her arms deep into the depths of his HRN, encircling him. Well, I'm ready to go. Mm, I can't think of a finer way to travel. Hold me, Ben. Let's fly, Bell. He put his arms around her and TK'd into the air. As usual, the TK didn't feel like he was really flying. It felt like the dream of flying, like he wasn't really in the air, just imagining it, and he would soon awake, going nowhere and not moving at all. He skimmed the ground slow at first, then picking up speed. Though the sister strength filled him, he had the memory of having the normal strength of a man, and carrying the rather dense and heavy Gwendolyn gave him the phantom feeling of muscle fatigue. He even thought for a moment he might drop her or crash into the ground. But he relaxed and allowed the sister's power to move through him. Eventually, carrying Gwen felt like nothing, and he settled in, picking up more speed, becoming a creature of the air. The tails of his HRN beat the ground, and he kicked up leaves. He plunged into the valley, hugging the contours of the land. Gwen, now familiar with the interior of his HRN, found his mega eye and got it out, holding it to her face. We're covering the ground well. Must have gone several miles already. I think if we bear to the south and come up on the monolith heading north, the natural shape of the thing will blank the George Parr scanning cones and shield us to some extent from Sherlamp. I see a storm coming in as well from the west. That should further confound their scopes. She moved the mega eye around and centered on the George Parr. There she is, orbiting aimlessly, still trailing smoke. They must be heavily damaged and might require dry docking. I estimate she's about 10,000 feet up. Never thought I'd loathe the sight of a fleet sprint ship. The speeding valley opened up into a broad flatland dotted by mirror-like pools of standing water and isolated pockets of tall, fern-like growths. Herds of gazelle-like animals peppered the landscape, moving amongst the ferns, using them as cover. Stenstrom did his best to avoid them to prevent the attention-attracting stampede. As they neared, the monolith came into clear focus, framed by the line of stormy clouds behind it. The face of the monolith appeared to be composed of a number of eyes lumped together, creating a very alien display. Gwen's thoughts spiraled. She had always thought the elders were more spirit than flesh, more conception than reality, and certainly not a horned, eye-covered creature of a distinctly alien note. She sketched as best she could with her arms confined by Stenstrom's embrace. They darted into the structure's massive shadow as a tempest boiled in from the west, pelting them with frigid rain. Gwen huddled within the folds of his HRN, protecting herself from the rain. This rain would chill her down to her marrow otherwise. She noticed something to the west. Belle, what's that? That ground covering of large fern-like plants just there, several miles to the west. I see it. Gwen scanned it with the mega eye. Look how the ferns are situated. They seem to be laid out in a systematic grid-like pattern. See there? And there, as well. I'll wager there's something beneath the surface creating a steady pressure of warmer air the ferns are taking advantage of. Bear west, Belle, bear west. We might be on the verge of a grand discovery. Stenstrom veered to the west. As Gwen said, the ground was dotted with patches of dense fern cover. He saw a flat spot and dropped to the ground. The ferns were huge, nine feet tall, and provided good cover. 
Gwen hopped out and together they searched the area. The ground felt a bit warmer, possibly from the humidity created by the ferns. As Gwen searched about, he moved on foot to the fern's edge and surveyed what was before them. Still about 30 miles away. I don't like the looks of this. The George Parr and Sherlamp have got the area covered. If we go much farther, they're going to have us zeroed regardless of what we do. We might not have to worry about that, Belle. Come here. Gwen sent, excited. At the base of a thick stand of ferns, she discovered a vent leading down into the ground, spewing humid, warm air. It seemed man-made. This seems to be a relief duct of some sort. I'll wager there's a massive complex beneath. We might be able to go to ground and access the monolith from underneath, safe and out of the eye of the George Parr. She cleared away the ferns. Can you help me? Suddenly, Gwen went silent. The air grew heavy, and Stenstrom <laughs> felt a tangible wave from the vent hit him full. He knew what it was. Fear given form. Gwen was locked in place at the opening of the vent, unable to move or think. She couldn't even draw her fedula and defend herself. Then something emerged from the vent and began pulling her down into the hole. The shadow tick goddess's bullabum under his shirt seemed to be working. He felt the ferocity of the fear, but the bullabung took just enough off that he could still function, still act. He seized Gwendolyn by the shoulders and pulled her back. Whatever had hold of her wasn't letting go, and he engaged in a brief tug of war with Gwen as the prize. With a final jerk, he pulled her free. He readied to take Gwen and TK away, but there was the George Parr, there was the hologram. If he came out of the ferns, they would be zeroed in seconds. Bell, came a hideous voice from the hole. I'm going to kill her, Bell. And then... <laughs> and then... His guts roiling in fear, he watched a pale, clawed hand creep out of the hole and rake the ground, making deep ruts. Protecting Gwen as best he could, he produced the stone knife and held it out. I have a weapon. I'll put you to the grave. The clawed hand pulled back a bit. It spoke again. But why? You won't kill me. I love you. It's the Merthig, isn't it? I'll stop her heart. And then we can be together. A fresh wave of terror crawled out of the hole and slammed into both of them. He grit his teeth and felt his guts constrict. Gwen, eyes dilated, convulsed. Gwen had no protection. Gwen was dying of fear. He had no choice. He took her and TK'd fast out of the ferns, heading towards the monolith as fast as he could. There's no place you can go that I can't follow. <laughs> As he feared, Hannah Ben Sherlamp instantly detected them as they broke into the clear, snapping her head around and pointing at them in the red blare of her scanning cones. There you are, you gutless cowards! The George Parr high overhead wobbled fitfully and came about. She seemed to be having issues maneuvering, and she also seemed to be having difficulty maintaining altitude. Thrusters fired. The smoke she had been trailing had gotten worse. The hologram pounded on her holographic desk. What are you waiting for? Fire! Fire! Gwen stirred in his arms. Gods, what in creation was that? I've never felt such fear. Tempest Fendal. As the effects of the fear subsided, Gwen lifted the mega eye. The George Parr is listing hard. See that? Their thermoplant is out. The damage the Seeker did to her must have been significant. They're running on nothing but gas compression and thrusters. I think they've got an internal fire too. See that? Stenstrom glanced up. The George Parr was in certain trouble. Even the hologram looked up at it, wondering what was going on. He spied a number of tiny objects blossom away from the ship like bees exiting a hive. They're deploying rip cars, suborbitals, every ancillary vessel they've got. 
I count twelve craft in all. They've abandoned ship. Gwendolyn followed the George Parr as it came down in a long, smoking curve. It rolled over in a terminal dive, flaming and shedding parts as it disappeared beneath the horizon. She turned her attention to the smaller craft that had emerged from it. She's end of mission, but we've got rip cars coming our way, Bell. Six of them. Stenstrom strained and TK'd faster, the great bulk of the monolith blotting out the sky. Then we have no choice but to fight. At last, they reached the perimeter of the monolith, the area doused in shadows. The monolith was craggy in the extreme, offering them innumerable places to take cover. They dove for the cracks and drew their weapons. Just as they situated themselves, the swarm of rip cars came in. Oh, good creation, Bell, look at them, Gwendolyn said, giving them the once over. They're bloody K listers, right off the damn boats. Duval's replaced his reputable fleet crew with K lister trash, so I wonder they couldn't keep their ship flying. K listers? You mean washouts? Riffraff who couldn't pass muster. I can see their 4D tattoos, a giant. K printed right on their disreputable faces, along with their list of offenses. The rip cars, six of them, roamed about, searching for them. Gwendolyn didn't like what she was seeing. Gods, they're mounting 99s, three guns per ship. Fast-firing guns like those will punch through this rock like nothing. And I'll wager they're kitted out with incendiary loads as well. Standing tall in the lead ship was Lieutenant Rem Deckard, the first officer they'd met in Blansford Village, her large hat and blue hair streaming in the breeze. The rip cars came in fast. There, there they are, one of the K Lister lookouts called, pointing in their direction. There were five crewmen aboard each rip car, one flying the ship, one operating the scanning devices, and the last three manning mounted 99 guns. In Gwen's mind, Stenstrom could see the dark blue K's stamped on their faces. K-listers, dishonored washouts who'd found safe haven on Captain Duval's renegade ship. They wore segmented Ansel Plaz armor to protect them from shrapnel and return fire. Stenstrom fired and aimed his ents at an approaching rip car. He hit the lookout and the man went limp, sliding into the bowels of the ship. The Armada formed a battlefront and brought their guns to bear. The K Lister crew seemed eager to begin. Get down, Stenstrom cried. A storm of unrelenting gunfire erupted, and they choked on clouds of pulverized stone as their cover was quickly scoured through. Follow me, Gwen sent, pulling him through a tight passage to another section of rocks. We're going to have to fight, Bell. I could pop them, but, but the Lacerda will be sure to hear it. Then we'll have to deal with her as well. She drew her tiny mims and cocked it. What are you going to do with that? He asked, noting the mims wasn't a very practical weapon in an actual battle situation. He waved up a green holy stone and threw it to their right. It cracked open and spewed a tangle of sticky webs. Instantly, the armada maxed fire on it. Stenstrom rose up and took aim at a nearby rip car, hovering about 12 feet above the ground. He fired in rapid succession, hitting two K-listers, manning guns, and a scanner. His shots passing right through their protective plating. The pilot reacted with shock seeing his fellows fall and tried to swerve away. Stenstrom lined him up and fired, killing the pilot. The rip car heeled over and went down hard, the composite structure of the vessel splintering against the ground. There! Rem Deckard cried. The armada reset their formation. They resumed cover and continued crawling to their left until they reached a dead end. A cloud of destruction followed them. Literally up against a wall, they had nowhere else left to go. Gwen, stay down, Stenstrom yelled as he faded into the shadows and leapt out into the open. Where are you going? Gwen sent in a panic. Invisible, he ran out under the armada, picked out a ship and fired up through the hull, pumping shots, aiming in the general area where the pilot would be situated. The ship shuddered. A limp arm appeared over the rim, and then it careened down, hitting the ground nose first. Dead and wounded people squirmed together in their harnesses. The remaining four Four rip cars jostled about in confusion for a moment. He's there! Rem Deckard yelled as the rip cars reoriented themselves to fire on his position. He sprinted to his right, moving away from where Gwen was hidden. He popped off two more shots and then got zeroed by a gunner, the force of the gunfire knocking him down. He should be dead, torn to pieces, but as usual, 
The sisters were with him, and he lived, absorbing the damage, the bullets bouncing off his HRN. He was still hooked into Gwen's mind. He saw the white of the K-Lister's eye standing out against the dark blue of their 4D tattoos as they hammered away with their guns. The pilot suddenly stood up in his seat and looking about dumbly. He grabbed his head. Blood squirted out through his fingers. Gwen had popped him hard and the man was dead. The rip car lurched and flipped over in midair, dumping all but two out into the open space where they fell to the ground, badly wounded from the fall. What the f- fuck is going on? Came a hideous mental wail. Oh, Belmont! Wait just a minute. Lila Serta, she had heard Gwen's pop and had them zeroed. I'll be right there. Don't go anywhere. A cloud of smoke formed in front of them. The Lacerda wafted in with considerable aplomb. She stood on the rock face, not bothering to get out of the way of the hail of bullets from the rip car. The bullets went around her in some cases stopped altogether and fell to the ground, her field of TK protecting her. Eyes wide, she stood before Stenstrom. Knock! Fucking knock, Joe boy! She yelled over the din of gunfire as he tried to stand. He waved up a red holy stone ready to throw it at her and set her ablaze. She reached out and cupped her hand around his, preventing him from throwing. She squeezed with impossible force, cracking the holy stone in his palm. A fireball erupted, enveloping both of their hands. Bell, Gwen sent. Ah, look what you did, the Lacerda said, putting the fire out with TK. Now you're going to have to buy me a drink or something. She locked his gaze with his and he couldn't look away. She buzzed him, scrambling the interior of his mind into chaos. It was an oddly lilting sensation as the floor to his reality dropped away. And he heard the rousing brass band play somewhere in his thought as he forgot who he was. And with that, we conclude part three, chapter three, The Tempest Findal. So we see that Captain Duval had replaced his crew with K-listers. And said K-listers are, as they mentioned, rejects or fleet washouts and they get what's known as a K stamp, they, which is section K of some fleet manual someplace. So they get a 4D tattoo of this giant K going across their face. And only fleet personnel, usually fleet officers, can see this 4D tattoo. So they see this person walking down the street or at a bar or whatever, and they'll see this bright blue K on their face. And it also prints out a list of their offenses whatever they happen to be as we find out in later books you can get put on the k list for small things for accidents things that weren't necessarily your fault but that once you're stamped as a k lister you're pretty much done in the fleet and a lot of them hang out at these bars in onaris they're called k lister bars just waiting to get hired on to, to some ship to you know basically pirates and mercenaries they'll do whatever I mean, their career is over. They're kind of in flux. They've been branded with a K across their face. It's It sucks. So that's why they were willing to fire on Stenstrom and Gwendolyn because they're K-listers. They don't give two shits about that. And apparently they're not as adept at damage control as a standard fleet crew would be as the damage the Seeker inflicted on them during their brief battle just got worse and worse and eventually they had to abandon ship as the, the George Parr crashed into the ground. They attacked them with suborbitals with all their little ships mounting 99s which are just like big long fast firing guns engaging them in a gun battle and then the Lacerda shows up brain buzzes Stenstrom into nothing. He's she's basically wiped his mind out, at least temporarily. Fun stuff, fun times, as they say. Not looking too good for our heroes. I'm familiar, I know, you know, it's been a while since I wrote this book, and I'm remembering a whole different sequence of events. I'm remembering a lot more of the journey going to the monolith in the distance, which, if you haven't already guessed, is the Shrine of Baraster. And the Shrine of Baraster is supposed to be like a relief image of the Elder Baraster. So if you're confused about what the Elders are, the Elders, 
And this is the League of Elder, and that's what this refers to, is the Elders are 25 alien beings of colossal planet-sized proportions who required certain types of starlight for sustenance. And they had the, the Elder kind, the League, basically, with them as their aides, as their servants, as their scouts, as their protectors, blah, blah, blah. And they would, in a benevolent way, go across the cosmos, find stars that were had the correct spectral composition for them to use as sustenance, and then also ensure that there was no life in the area that depended on this star for life, for warmth, or whatever. And if there was, they would not go to that star. They would only go to uninhabited star systems and feed. That went on for basically millions of years. The elders going from one place to the other, the the elder kind, the league, moving, you know, habiting home worlds. So they, they came from Earth long ago. That's where the elders got them from, Earth, long, long ago. And then they moved on to a place called Lemura, and then they moved on to Camera, and then they moved on to Emira. And then they moved on to Aang. And then they moved on to Kena, which is the current, where they currently are. But the elders, when they got to Kena, were old and they basically died off. They disappeared. No one really knows what happened to them. Now, there are the Zaffins, who are four creatures just like the elders, who were much more brusque about their feeding. They didn't care who they hurt with their feeding and during the great portrayal a number of elder kind fled the league and went to the Zaffins. so when you say Zaffin, that's what i mean is these four creatures that are like the elders who are much more relentless in their feeding and the Zaffins serve them basically so that that's that and the elders were were supposed to be just they just to look at them according to the ancient text they were supposed to look like like a moon you know, just like a like a planetary body. But according to this statue of Barastor, that's not what they look like. They look like a giant alien head covered in eyes with horns. You know, Gwendolyn was shocked. Like, is that what an elder actually looks like? And maybe. But that is the shrine of Barastor. Finally, we're finally there. And I love this sort of stuff. I love creating worlds. I love world building and adding cool things like the Shrine of Baraster and even Hannah Ben Sherlam's hologram. But I'm remembering a, a vastly different set of sequences. It must have been cut out. I must have deleted it eventually, I guess. I don't know. But I'm remembering things unfolding quite a bit different. Anywho, but that's not what we get. We stick to what's on the page. I I, I must have deleted it because I, I found a better way. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? In any event, Stenstrom's been captured. Gwendolyn's being pinned down by k Fire. And they also, before I forget, encountered what appears to be the Tempest Vindal, hitting them full with fear. But the Shadow Tech Goddess's Bolabung worked well enough that Stenstrom could get Gwendolyn away. This creature that just is relentlessly pursuing him across the plains, wanting to suck his energy dry like a vampire. So apparently the Tempest Vindal knows he's there. The Lacerda has him too. So things aren't looking good for our, our heroes. Next week, we continue Part 3, Chapter 4, The Shrine of Barastor. So here we are at last at this mythical ancient place on faraway Aang. Just like Atlantis or Lemuria or at the tomb of Alexander. Something like that. I just love that. So we'll find out what's inside and what happened to Stenstrom next week. Until then this is Ren Presents. I'm your host Ren. Peace out. <laughs>